thank you, Jesus. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord. I want to tell you right now, He can do whatever He wills. Anything He's done for anybody, anywhere, at any time, He can do for us here and now this morning. He's able to do that. And can I take that a step further? Right now, He's downstairs in children's church. And he's in the nursery. And he's in this building and every other worship center where people have gathered all at once. You hear me? I don't have to talk about your issue today. He knows you. We don't have to sing about your particular battle or problem. He knows exactly where you are. And he can help you right here and right now there's a powerful thing that happens when God's people come together he said if two or three agree together touching any one thing it would be given he said when two or three gather together in his name he's there but you hear me what God does in your life is not tied to what comes across the pulpit today he can help you right where you are right where you are amen I'm ringing guys I don't it's probably my fault but you know what, let's just ask him to help us right now. Can we do that, Lord? We want you to have your way in this place. We come against every hindrance. God, the baggage we brought through the doors with us, our misconceptions, our preconceived ideas, our assumptions. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you would work in such a way that we could just surrender our heart and mind to you today, hold nothing back from you, and allow you to have your pure and perfect way in this place. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll be going to 2 Timothy chapter 4. As mentioned, the youth are doing a fundraiser downstairs. And uh, I think that's burgers and hot dogs, all kinds of fat-free stuff. Looking forward to that. And there, there are ministry job fair booths there. If you want to find a way to get more involved, we certainly want you to. I am not sharing the, the Bible study that I prepared this week. I uh, woke up at an odd time and had one simple story and concept on my mind. And uh, I believe the Lord wants to simply help somebody here today. You hear me. I don't pretend to know what you're living through. And I don't belittle it. And I know when I've lived through my greatest struggles and battles, no one else really knew what was happening. I came to the Lord in a season of chaos in my life, in my family. Absolute chaos. And God didn't just sustain me, but breathe life into me in the midst of that chaos. And I've learned something since then. You've heard me say it. Today, it's not what you're going through. It's how you're going through it. It really is. We know that life is a few days and full of troubles. And I celebrate the trouble-free days because I know that this demonic... TV gospel that says if you just love Jesus you'll never get sick and and uh, you know if you do he'll heal you in 10 seconds and if you send us 25 bucks a month you'll be a millionaire by supper time you hear me that's not necessarily how the world works but God always works so I've really only got to do a couple of things now this is simple if you want deep come back Wednesday 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 2. Paul told his young protege in the gospel, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Really patient, doctrinally sound. For the time will come, he said in verse 3, when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, their desires shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So while that's happening, what did God call him to do? 
He said in verse 5, but watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. This is what we do while all that's happening. Make full proof of thy ministry. He said, for I am now ready, verse 6, to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. We've preached about this before. Not even the Apostle Paul could say he kept the course. Stumbled off, colored out a lot. I finished. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Quickly, two more verses. Matthew 24, verses 12 and 13. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. We've covered that. That's when and where we live. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Wherever you are, whatever you're living through, whatever you've lost, whatever you're losing, whatever you're dealing with, grasping for sanity and certainty and direction, you hear me. There are three words that change my life. And as long as I can say them before God, everything else is going to be fine. I'm still here. Now, I don't know what you're wrestling with, but you hear me right now. You're standing with the people of God. You're in the house of God. And as long as you can place yourself before Him and at His feet, if you can survive and endure what you're going through, you're going to find that He is going to move and He is going to help you. Jesus said, speaking of that last terrible season, He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. He he does the saving, but he called you and I to endure some things from time to time. Paul told Timothy, endure afflictions because they're just going to come. You hear me today, God is going to help us. Let's thank him together one more time for what he's already brought us through, what he's already given. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You, you may be seated. There's a dichotomy in some spirit-filled circles I've seen. And uh, I, you can almost, uh, if we're not careful, start separating people into, into two groups and two, two piles of spiritual perspective. There are some people, good people, people that I know and people that I love, who spiritualize everything. Have you ever known those folks? I didn't just have a flat on my way to the meeting. But the forces of anti-inflation darkness have demonically possessed my tires to hinder my progression to fulfill the purpose of God in my afternoon. Those people would tell me that I'm not chubby. The spirit of obesity has attached itself to my life. That my love for hostess products is demonically possessive. And that it can be cast out in a service and I'll be skinny when it's over. I'll look like Richard Simmons with a different hair. There are people who, who, whatever's happening in their life, it is a demonic spirit. And I understand where they're coming from. I, to an extent, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, the Bible said, but really against principalities and spirits and wickedness. We're battling princes and, uh, of darkness and in high places. I understand that. But then there are the others who, who, who spiritualize nothing. And I understand my flesh is my grave battle and those people those people it doesn't matter how spectacular or how miraculous the work around them they never see that and they never perceive that now I've got a theory about skepticism we're supposed to hit it head on we talk about the miracles we've seen here all the time and if the more notable the miracle is in the more people watched it the more we talk about it because it's one thing for me to share what happened to me but when it's something you saw 
saw happen, it's real for you. I, I talked to Brother Matt Benson this morning. We're not going to keep talking about this, but we've said a lot about it over the last five weeks. We were, many of you were here the Wednesday night when, uh, when God touched Sam while he was over here, and we've rejoiced about it, and we've thanked God for it because, uh, you know, they had told Sam he was lost 90% of his vision, and uh, he was down to, to just uh, decre- thinning tunnel vision, that he'd be completely blind in short order, and there's nothing they were going to be able to do. And so we were here, many of you were standing there when God touched him in the middle of that service, and he had periphery vision for the first time in his life and all that good stuff. He went to a real live bona fide specialist in Dallas this last week, and do you know what they told him? He must have been completely misdiagnosed, this and that are not the same, because he's not lost 90% of his division. As a matter of fact, this and that and that have all changed, because God does stuff like that. Now you hear me, God does those things. But as aside from those who spiritualize everything, there are those who want to minimize everything. I mean, I really do believe if you had uh, an entire uh, coven of witches and four druid priests outside of some folks I've known's uh, driveway and they're, you know, sacrificing those cats from Ohio and they're, they're spreading their stuff all around and praying curses on your house and the cold draft blows in and it gets dark and lightning begins to strike in the middle of clear blue skies. There are those folks who would say, we're just having the oddest weather. Now hear me, we're not devil preaching today. That's not it. My flesh is my issue. We've said this before, the Bible's clear. Submit yourself therefore unto God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So when you're in demonic encounter, it is submission and it is resistance. And that really is how it works. But I do think it's important. There are things that happen. I know that two things are a liar. My flesh and the Bible said the devil. I know that he is the accuser of the brethren. And I know that in me, that is in my flesh, Paul said dwelleth no good thing I know that he is a discourager and I know that our own carnality is discouraging he is a deceiver and our battles not just demonic deception our greatest battle is often self-deception the Bible calls him a destroyer but you hear me our own flesh our own unchecked carnality wreaks destruction in our life so today I'm not aiming at you and I and I'm not aiming at the devil I'm aiming at both of them because we have to understand how this works in an effort to frame that for our mind in the New Testament Testament, the Word of God says that he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That tells me that number one, he's real. But two, he can't just devour anybody that he wants to. He's on the prowl seeking whom he may devour. Have you ever heard a, ro- a lion roar? The first time it happened for me, I was uh, pushing my, uh, one of our kids in a, in a stroller through a zoo and I guess we were just there at the right time and we were just close enough and and that, that, that big male lion jumped up on his rock. He does it every day, apparently by the clock, and let this ferocious roar out and everything else in the zoo fell silent. And I thought about that verse because my instant uh, reflex was to freeze. I mean, everything just stopped. I stopped in mid-sentence. And that's what the roar of a lion does. It really does cause a physical freeze, a temporary, because this is how it works. The Bible was, the Word of God was trying to illustrate for us in the spiritual side of that fight. That's how demonic forces work. They really can freeze, try to convince you to stop, to stand still. But that's not what we're dealing with today. What I'm dealing with today, I want you to know whether your issues are from hell itself, from your own twisted flesh, or from this world around you. We have to understand stand if we decide we're going to do it God will always help us and you can make it if you want to no matter what your spouse is doing no matter what your parents aren't doing no matter what your kids are into you might cover yourself with condemnation or hell itself may try to get you to turn your eyes on your fellow worshipers and begin to pull apart everyone else and their issues and their imperfections and their struggles and their circumstances you might deal with misery 
You might deal with sickness, but no matter what's happening in your life, whether you're convinced that none of these people love you or whether you struggle to love yourself, whatever you think about society, whatever you think about the country, whatever you think about the church, somewhere along the line, I've got to believe the Word of God and plant my feet and make my mind up. I am going to be an endurer. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. See, here's the deal. You have the final veto. Seeking whom he may devour. It's up to me. It's in my hands. It is within me to decide. It is within me to decide whether or not I'm his. Now this is really simple. Sometimes we have to get back at a Sunday school children's level. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I can know that God's spirit is in Brother Long. And I can know that God's spirit is in Sister Lewis. And I can know that God's spirit is in this one or in that one. Whether you understand it or not, when he filled you with to me after service, been seeking the Holy Ghost, told me he was working at midnight. And in midnight at work, listening to preaching I think he said online God filled him with the Holy Ghost in the middle of his workstation here's what you got to understand it is the exact same spirit that he gave Peter and Mary on the day of Pentecost it is the exact same spirit that you saw work miraculously when God healed so many here in these last few weeks I don't have anything that you don't have and they don't have anything that you don't have and what God's done in and through and for us he will do for you and in the midst of frustration and fear and discouragement we've just got to step back and remember he is not just real and miraculous he is the same he is no respecter of persons he doesn't like me and dislike you he is the same and so in the midst of fear and frustration what I need doesn't come from a church service and it doesn't necessarily come from a preacher and it doesn't necessarily come from my fellowship circle and all of those things matter but you hear me Jesus said the water that I give you will be in you a well springing up into everlasting life it is within me to decide on that note that final decision that will that settles the issue our Bible is a story one long story told by many small ones. It's an illustration, a real life illustration of people who had to grasp that in the midst of their own personal failure and incredible spiritual demonic pressure. Paul from the beginning was a target for what the Bible would call the fiery darts of the devil. He's literally on his way to imprison the church at Damascus. He's got destruction on his mind. He's there to end it. He's there to stop it. Have you ever noticed this? There are things in life that I don't like. I don't like creamy peanut butter. It shouldn't exist. Peanut butter should be extra crunchy that's not up for debate you don't have to believe that you're wrong I don't need you to hate creamy peanut butter I can hate it enough for both of us and if you happen to like it I just know that's more good stuff for me I don't need you to dislike the things that I dislike there are certain forms of music I'd rather be deaf than have to hear it every day I don't need you to hate it with me. I can do that by myself. Have you ever noticed those people that get a burr in their, in their saddle about the kingdom of God? They're not happy until you're just as unhappy as they are. It's not enough for them to say, yeah, no thanks, until you feel that way too. Nothing else is going to work for them. Now, I don't understand people like that. I don't. But Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, he was that guy. 
It's not enough for him to say, I'm not doing that. He had to breathe out threatenings and slaughter against the church. He is there to destroy it. And he's on his way to Damascus with soldiers to imprison the church at Damascus. And while he's on his way there, there's this blinding light from heaven. It knocks him down flat on his face. And the men with him, the soldiers heard a voice. But the Bible says they never saw a man. And the Lord began to talk to him. You know the story in Acts chapter after nine, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I, I am Curios, supreme being, supreme in authority. And he said, who art thou, Lord? Curios. Uh, he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And so he's converted in one moment of time. He spends a few days praying and fasting and blindness. And God sends a preacher there. And he's filled with the Spirit. He baptizes him. And and everything began to unravel in that movement. And this persecutor, this man who breathed out threatenings, now he's not just filled with God's spirit. He's not just baptized. He goes straight to the synagogue, opening and alleging, the Bible said, that Jesus is the Messiah. And I don't know if it was the devil or just the religious folks around him, but they got upset either way. As a matter of fact, they hatched a simple plan. There's only one gate. There's one way in the town and there's one way out of the town and we're going to take shifts we're going to stay there armed and when he tries to leave we're going to kill him and I want you to understand he's a new convert he came out of the baptistry his hair is still wet you might say and he's got a price on his head the men that he was leading are now out to kill him and so he, here he is he's brand new but some of those big strong burly young men in the church they took him to the other side of town they put him in a basket and wrapped a giant rope around it and they lowered him over the edge of the city walls and so he rode away to safety and to find a deeper revelation and understanding to further his relationship with God and while he's riding away he's been in one service you might say he's had one supernatural experience he turned right around and began to share the gospel because you don't have to be an expert to share the gospel you don't have to have been through classes or Bible college you all you need is what Paul had I didn't know him this is how I met him this is what happened to me straight to the synagogue he went and he began to share the gospel and now here he is moving away they've already tried to kill him and he survived that first step I wish I had time to get into this it was the young men in the church that he came to arrest who literally saved his life you hear me you and I need each other and I don't ever mind holding the rope for you because because one day I'm going to be the basket case and I'm going to need you to hold the rope for me. And those men did not know him. They didn't do this because they knew him. They did this because they knew Jesus. They hadn't had an opportunity to fall in love with him but they were shared in one spirit and by one bloodline. What we do for one another, it's not because we click. It's not because we share hobbies. It's not because we share interests. It's because we share a savior. It's not because we're the same age or in the same income bracket or education level. It's because we share a Savior. So away he goes back to Jerusalem. A little while later, the Holy Ghost spoke to the people and said, separate unto me Barnabas and Paul for the work I have for them. He goes to Lystra and a man who's never walked before was healed. The people got so excited they want to crown him a god. They wanted to move immediately to preacher religion. And Paul said, oh, Bubba, we're not gods, but we are here to tell you about what. And sure enough, the devil stirred up the, 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 the town and the area. you got to be so careful about people because the people applauding you today may want to kill you tomorrow and you can't take that personal. If you're not careful, you can pour yourself out into trying to help and minister to people. And the moment that it doesn't suit their present mood and life interest, they can turn on you with a drop of a hat. Honey, don't you ever take that personal. They did that to him. They did that to Paul. And they'll do that to you. But you're not doing this because you love somebody. You're doing this because somebody loves you. You're not doing this because you fit in the group. You're doing this because of the Savior of the group. And here he is. They went from he is a God to we've got to get rid of him. They drug him outside of the city, the Bible says, and they stoned him. 
Now, I don't know if he passed out or if he died. I've always wondered if this is when he later said, I don't know if I was in my body or out, but was called up to the third heaven. I don't know. But the guys with the rocks thought he was dead. And the church thought he was dead. And all of a sudden, when the crowds had drifted away, that bloody hand starts pushing stones off the pile. And he got up. He walked right back into the city. Virtually right back to the pulpit. Right back to his mission. Now, I don't know if it crossed his mind right then or if it took a little while. I know I've lived through things not that dramatic that I'd never want to go through again. But I also know what it means when you have that moment of purpose when you step back up with a dried blood on his temple. I'm still here. Do you hear me? Don't ever fall into the social pressure where you need 900 Facebook likes for the thing you're trying to do or you judge yourself and others by how they interact with your Instagram page. Who do you think you are? Listen to me. He had it straight when I do what he called me to do. There are people who don't like it. They're going to throw stones. That's between them and the Lord. I'm not going to throw them back. When I do what God called me to do and the church gives up on me and thinks I'm dead and they drift back to town, he said that's between them and God. But he had it straight in his mind on the other side of that. No matter who loves me or hates me, no matter who's for me or against me, he said this is about me being for him and him loving me. And he just never quit. He went to Philippi walking down the street and a girl possessed with a demonic spirit. Literally, she would tell the future. I don't know if she did horoscopes or tarot cards or if she read palms, but, 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 but she foretold the future for people. And uh, she walks around with those two guys and, and she says, everybody listen to them. Spirit of God's in these men. They're the real deal. It really does matter who's doing your advertising because Paul, who no doubt felt sorry for her, he knows she's demonically possessed. He cannot allow her to tie what God's doing and what she's doing together. There are people that we do not want to be unified with or lumped together with. And so he turned around and he literally said, come out of her. And instantly this young woman is completely delivered but now she can't tell the future anymore she's a slave so her owners are mad because now they've lost their money two friends of mine remember the psychic that used to be on uh, loop 281 there was an RV for sale there a preacher friend of mine stopped there with a relative of his who wanted to look at it they got out and they looked and looked and looked and he said, I can't believe they're not coming out here to talk to us. He said, she knows you're not going to buy it. All at once, this slave girl has no means to make money for her owner. So they file charges. Paul and Silas are arrested. They're beaten. They're put into the dungeon. As a matter of fact, down to the lowest part of the cell. They were in the basement cell. Their backs had been beaten and now are literally dripping blood. They're not having fun. They're not comfortable. And it gave birth to that famous story we've preached sermons and written songs about. Because the Bible says at midnight, in that dungeon with the rats and the dry blood, Paul and Silas began to sing. Now most of you know the story. I don't know what they say and you don't know what they say. The powerful thing is that they say I've got an idea. Let's just have a worship service. Right here we, we can't clap. Or, 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 we're locked up. We don't have an organ. We don't have a keyboard. We don't have praise singers. We don't have a youth group. We don't have a church building. We don't have anybody with us. It's just you and I. There's no air conditioning. There's nobody to preach to. 
There's nobody to sing to, but he understood something. You're never singing to us. We're always doing this for him. See, it really doesn't matter what people think of your outward praise because it's not for them anyway. It doesn't matter who participates, who's frustrated with it, who finds ways to criticize it. It's not for them anyway. They began to sing. I don't know what they sing. But when they begin to lift up their voices together, singing in that dark dungeon, something powerful began to happen in heaven. And then something powerful happened in earth. We say it all the time, there's two components to the supernatural, super and natural. And only God can do the super. Brothers and sisters, only we can do the natural. This happened when you came to God. Somewhere you, you, you bowed your head with a heart uh, heavy under conviction and you prayed a prayer of repentance. You moved your natural lips with your natural mind. You made a decision and confessed that you were a sinner and asked God to forgive you. And you received supernatural forgiveness. And if you're like me, I climbed my natural body into natural water and a human being submerged me and and spoke a supernatural name and then that covenant we made I received supernatural remission of my sins I raised my natural hands in an altar surrounded by 11 people I didn't know I began to talk to Jesus with my mind my heart and my mouth but there was a supernatural response that began to move into my body I was a Baptist kid who didn't even believe in speaking in tongues until it happened to me nobody told me I was going to do that I wasn't trying to do that but everything changed he said if there be any sick among you let them call for the elders of the church natural he said anoint them with oil natural the prayer of faith something super kicks in and they shall be saved now here they are and they begin to sing it's a decision that they made they decided that they were going to do this it was premeditated praise they're expressing to God how they feel about him they're expressing to God how they feel about him see the Bible said the Bible said that no temptation will destroy us matter of fact no temptations even uh, come upon you but that which is common to man and they understood I don't need a new song for this I'm in a new place but it's the same old God I don't need a new way to go about it I'm in a new place but it's the same old God no trouble can defeat me and so they began to sing and in the midst of that something happened in heaven do you hear me I'm not part of the cult of worship that thinks you can juke and jive your way through your issues but I do believe you should love him in spite of those issues and right in the middle of it I don't think jumping is going to fix everything in my life. But the Bible did command us to leap for joy. And everybody I've ever found who criticized that had an entirely different set of issues. It's, it's one thing to respond when it's going well and the presence of God is here. These guys are bound up and they're locked up and they're by their self. And they made an intentional decision about expressing their feelings and their relationship with God. And when they began to sing, God began to move. I, I don't know how it went down maybe he stopped the angelic choir and said everybody listen to this and his eyes landed on those bleeding bound men who had made their mind up I'm battling depression I'm going to make sure I sing a little louder and a little longer things aren't working for me I'm going to move up two rows and be the first one in the prayer room I I don't understand what's happening so I'm not just going to come early I'm going to stay late I'm not waiting for God to fix this I want him to know when things are tough for me I'm leaning in I'm not pulling back I'm reaching up I'm not laying down maybe he did it with his voice maybe he did it with his spirit maybe he sent an angel to each corner of the prison I don't know But I do know that at some point he made a decision 
Something like when they get through that verse and go back into that course, I'm going to show those guys something. And the Bible said while they yet sang, that if suddenly there was a great earthquake, that when that earthquake came, all the prison doors were open. And everybody's bonds were loosed. I wish I had time for this. Honey, don't you stop singing right now. Sometimes you just need one more verse and everything's going to be fine. Don't stop in the middle of the nightmare. Don't stop in the middle of the battle. Don't stop in the middle of the discouragement. All you got to do is keep walking with them. All you got to do is keep living for them. All you got to do, if you will, is just keep singing. And that thing tore apart. I wish I had time for this. You know what I love about it? The Bible says the foundations. You know what that means? They couldn't shut those prison doors anymore. I mean, you knock a window out, we can put a new window in. You tear the roof open, we can fix the roof. The foundation's messed up of this, uh, 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 of this building that has a basement. Those doors aren't going to close anymore. It, it, it can never be a prison again. I wish I could get into this, honey. If God gets you out, all of hell can't ever put you back in that cell. If God gets you out, all of humanity can't put you back into that cell. And if you've decided that you're going to return to it and you've walked back into it, that's your decision. But I'm here to tell you today, you can walk right back out because when God levels and brings deliverance, it's down to the found. The jailer runs in. Oh, they're going to kill me because I let everybody go. He's about to commit suicide. And Paul says, do thyself no harm. We're all here. Now, I understand why Paul and Silas are there. They're probably still singing. But we're all here. Those guys that have problems coming and time left on their sentence and maybe worse, they're still here too. Now, I don't know and you don't either. But I just can't help but wonder if they didn't experience something in the middle of their incarcerated, messed up, backward place. Something they had never gotten from alcohol. Something they had never gotten from money. Something they had never gotten from relationships. Something they couldn't steal, beg, borrow, or earn. There they are. And they're all hanging around. And you know what happened. Revival breaks out in the jailer's family. They baptize him. They baptize his entire household. And then they go back to jail jail and the next morning the big shots show up oh, we're sorry fellas we've talked to your lawyers we didn't know y'all were Roman citizens my bad you're free to go and Paul said oh no 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 we're citizens you jailed us without a trial you abused us without cause this is illegal you've messed up bad and if you think that I'm gonna leave here before the Sun comes up and not let anybody know you're out of your mind if you don't want me to press charges we're gonna have a parade everybody in town is gonna see me and they're going to hear what I have to say. I'm not just sneaking out of prison and it's not going to be a secret. Everybody is going to know it. Brother B.J. Thompson's son, Maximus, received the Holy Ghost in the youth service I think five weeks ago. He started class at UT Tyler. Last Wednesday night, he brought four friends with him. I got two texts from ministry staff there. They had never been before. God filled two of them with the Holy Ghost in the middle of service because let me tell you how this works. If you want to change your life when God does something for you tell everybody don't be shy about it when God does something for you not me not us but when God does something for you the whole world needs to hear it no I want the high school band and flags and flyers I, I want the mayor's old convertible I'm gonna uh, driving me real slow everybody in town is gonna know my back's sore, but I'm still here. And I've got cuff marks, but I'm still alive. This was the worst night of my life, but I hadn't quit. And I'm not going to quit. And God's just as real when I'm locked up as he is when I'm running loose. And he's just as good when I'm bound as he is when I'm free. And he's just as loving when I'm broken and when as he is when I'm whole. I wish I had time. 
they, uh, they, they, they tried to get him in the riot in Jerusalem. He made it through that. Soldiers showed up and saved him. They did this foolish thing. A bunch of them got together and said, we're not going to eat or drink until he's dead. Paul appealed to Caesar. 200 armed soldiers marched him out of town. Nobody laid a finger on him. I don't know if those guys starved to death or if they're still fasting today. He gets in a boat. He's immediately caught in a two-week hurricane. The ship is shattered. He floats to an island on boards. Should have, could have drowned, but he didn't. He's trying to help when he gets on the beach to gather wood for the fire. We don't have time for this. I've got five minutes, but the barbarians were making fires. That was never going to do for Paul. He needed something else. So that may be warm for you, but Bubba, I've been hot before. Let me show you how to do this. And he's gathering wood to build a fire. And out of the heat, the Bible said, out of the heat, while he's trying to make the fire hotter, while he really is doing his best, out of the heat came this viper, and it latched on to him. He shook it immediately off into the fire. But those locals knew what kind of viper that was, and they all told each other, he'll be dead in the morning. That dude must have done something. And terrible and that's why they've got him incarcerated and they're taking him to Rome he'll be dead tomorrow even though he escaped the storm and the sea justice has found him on the beach you know what he did while they're lying and making assumptions and running their mouth about him he didn't defend himself he just kept gathering sticks and while they're yeah yeah and questioning his life and his motives honey don't you ever fall into the trap of fighting with people who don't know the whole story and have no clue what's going on you let God have that I'm just going to keep gathering sticks I can't change their mind but I can do what I need to do I'm going to stay near the fire they all went to bed they woke up and he's fine his hands not even swollen and those people that were tearing him apart last night with their mouth now said hey that dude's a God our friend Publius is sick will you go pray for him too here Paul is, walking across the island to pray for Publius with people who thought he should die last night and now they want to build a temple for him, if you will. But he never went down when they criticized him. And his head never swole up when they loved him because he knew without the goodness of God he'd still be in the same spiritual pit he had started in. But he also had one more thing going for him. There's only one sure way to victory. You don't quit. That's it. You don't stop. You know what we're supposed to want to hear? Well done, now good, faithful servant. There's one way to guarantee if I really do believe that I'm going to an eternal city and I want a mansion there, all I've got to do to go to heaven is keep going. All I've got to do to go to New Jerusalem is just keep going. It's not revival that tells the tale but when calamity and your life's falling apart and you feel that weight and pressure on your chest and you can't see where the answer's coming from, honey you love him and serve him right in the middle of that and he's going to take care of everything else. Almost done. Matter of fact, let's stand. We're 1952. It's a championship boxing match. It's a famous one. There was an old, coming to the end of his career, old champion. But this kid he was fighting was different. He was undefeated. He was much younger. He was bigger. He was faster. And the style they fought in then, worst of all, he had a longer reach. He could hit you at a distance from which you could not hit him. And they barreled right into it. Later it would have been a TKO because that champion didn't go down one time. He didn't go down two times. There he is, blood pouring from his eyes, spit a tooth out when he got back to the corner. And his trainer who loved him told him, you don't have to do this to yourself. You've got nothing to prove. He used the words, your life speaks for itself. 
Let me throw the towel in. He smiled. He said, I'm never going to throw the towel in. And back into the ring he went. He literally lost every round on the scorecard. But in one moment, where the young man had left himself a little too exposed after a big punch, he caught him just right. And for the first time that night, down the young challenger went. And he stayed down. And the old champion limped out to fight another day. They asked him immediately afterwards, reporter, did you think it was over when you hit the ground the first time? He said, no. He said, did you really believe you were done when you were on the mat the second time? He said, let me stop you right there. I don't ever lose because I just keep getting back up. The only difference in a winner and a loser is the winner gets up one more time. The Bible said, though a just man fall seven times, yet shall he rise. Do you know seven's God's number of completion? That means a just man is a complete failure. A just man is a complete failure. What makes him just is not that he does not fall. What makes him just is that though he falls completely, yet shall he rise. That's what the prophet meant when he penned those famous words. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemies, for when I fall, I shall arise. But in the end, they cut Paul's head off, right? In the end, he died. I had a friend one time who was convinced, if we do this right, God will heal everybody of everything. And if anybody's sick, they're not right with God. I said, that how come everybody's dead? What does he not heal? Well, you were 96. He's going to heal everything now that you're 96. You read about what happened to those apostles. Don't let any version of that prosperity gospel dilute your mind into believing that when you're limping through difficult seasons in time, you're abandoned or neglected or backslid. Honey, that's not how this works. But you hear me. He is right there with you. And he is a healer. And he is a provider. The Lord is my helper. In our text, he told Timothy right before he died, watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. He said, for I am now ready. I wasn't ready in Damascus. I wasn't ready in Philippi. But I am ready. I had stuff to do in the sea and on the island, but I'm now ready to be offered for the time of my departure. He didn't say death. Because if there's a departure, there's a destination. One day they'll will me into this room or one like it. And eulogize me and y'all make me look good. Lie, lie, lie. You hear me? That is not a demise. It's a departure. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished my course. And I've kept the faith. And they laid him down. You believe it how you want to. We can have a Bible study and argue about it. But I believe it just like Jesus told the thief on the cross. Today you'll be with me in my father's house in paradise. When the beggar Lazarus died, the Bible said those angels bore him straight up to Abraham's bosom. 
I believe he closed his eyes when the axe fell and he opened them in the presence of God and he understood something that we've got to get in our heart and get in our mind whatever you're living through whatever you're going through there's got to be a little grit in your back where you understand I'm still living through it and I'm still going through it and I don't know how God's going to get me through this and I don't know how he's going to solve it but he's God and I know he's going to and I'm just not going to quit for better or worse for richer or poorer in sickness and in health I'm going to walk with him until he brings me to him I'm never going to stop I had a lot to say this morning and I never even got there but you hear me I want us to get this in our heart and in our mind whether we're fighting people whether we're fighting temptations and addictions in our own flesh whether we're really wrestling against demonic spirits honey there's one way to go through it I'm still here I'm still alive I don't understand it but I still love him I'm still gonna talk to him I'm still gonna thank him I'm still gonna walk with him I'm not going to quit whatever happens to me it's gonna happen to me in Jesus to do we lift our hearts and voices together right now come on in jesus name god i'm asking you to give us a revelation of the delivering power of continuing i'm asking you right now to move our hearts and minds lord help us to purpose in our heart through frustration and discouragement and sickness and want and need and fear and apprehension and guilt and domestic disharmony and the aftermath of tragedy and loss and setback and loneliness god i'm gonna walk with you and i trust you to take care of the rest of it you can point me where you want to point me you can do with me what you will 